Welcome to Researching the Research, a podcast by Horacio Perez, dedicated to exploring the methods of researchers from diverse fields, academia, industry, and independent. We delve into this through in-depth interviews, thought-provoking debates, and by sharing techniques and strategies to enhance all aspects of the research process. Moreover, we present open-ended discussions that are intended to stir your curiosity and inspire reflection. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It always depends from the place we are listening to this podcast. And I would like to welcome today our very special guests, Francesco Perono Casiafoco. Hello, Francesco. How are you? Hello. Everything okay. Thank you. Great. And Siyue. Hi, Siyue. How are you? Hi. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and, and today <clears throat> we are going to talk about the very interesting research line that Francesco Perono and Siyue are currently working on. But uh, I would like, uh, I would ask uh, first, uh, Francesco, if you can give a, a very brief introduction about uh, who are you and how did you get into the research work that you are currently doing? Yeah, uh, th thank you, Horacio. I am Francesco Perono Cacciafoco. Uh, currently, I am an associate professor in linguistics uh, at uh, Xi'an Tong Liverpool University in Suzhou, Jiangsu, China. Before being here, I was in uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. I'm a linguist, I'm a historical linguist, so I study the origins uh, of languages uh, and I'm a language documentarist. Uh, so I try to document uh, endangered languages uh, which uh, are uh, risky to, to disappear. Uh, soon. These are my main uh, uh, specializations. I'm Italian. I studied uh, at the University of Pisa in Italy. And then uh, because of uh, many reasons, uh, when I was younger, I left. So before Singapore and now currently uh, China. So th this is what, more or less. Okay. And Shiyue, can you briefly introduce you? Um, hi, uh, my name is uh, Shiyue. And currently I'm a a university student who's a major in linguistics, and I'm a, a research assistant of, of uh, Professor Francesco. And my research interest mainly covers about the field linguistics and anthropological linguistics, and also some cognitive linguistics. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Very, very interesting. So, uh, I would suggest to start. Uh, can you? Um, can you quickly tell us, uh, I'll, read, I'll read a little bit about a book that Francesco published, a book called Place Names. Uh, don't worry about all the information because I will leave in the show notes all the links to all the publications and, and website of Francesco and Shijue. But uh, my first question would be, uh, what was your, your main uh, motivation when you started to work on this book, Place Names? and uh, what is the main, uh, what is this book about, Be very briefly? Yeah, there are two, two, two main points or two main reasons. You know, uh, as a historical linguist, uh, I reconstructed the origins of languages. Uh, I'm an etymologist, so I reconstructed the history of words. And when you try to reconstruct the history of languages, languages, of course, they change over time in the European languages, for example. Uh, and the lexical items, the words we use today, like you and me, they change over time uh, at a certain rate of speed. When you need to go back in time, uh, you need to refer to more stable lexical items. And those more stable lexical items uh, generally are place names. Place names don't change very much over time. Place names are preserved over time. Sometimes when there is a change in population, the new people speaking a new language, they don't erase them completely. They preserve them. So they are sort of linguistic fossils uh, to reconstruct the past. Therefore, when you study historical linguistics, uh, 
in all the language families of the world, that place names are very important because they are tracks, they are fossils, uh, sometimes living fossils, which is a paradox, and they allow you to discover and to the, the mm. voice of uh, ancestors uh, who live in, in a time uh, without writing, for example. So, I mean, place names are relevant for my study for that reason, because they are very special uh, lexical items. You can go back in time uh, in prehistory before writing, uh, and you can still understand uh, something of uh, the spoken language uh, of uh, our prehistoric ancestors. For the book itself, uh, uh, the book was born uh, just uh, because of a uh, contingency, how to say, uh, I was in a Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. I was teaching a course in toponymy and toponomastics, mm. the disciplines uh, of the, the study of place names. And uh, every week uh, I was uh, providing my students with the readings uh, as usual, but they were telling me, okay, this article is very interesting. This paper is great. This chapter is uh, very good, but why uh, don't you give us uh, a textbook or a handbook in toponymy? And the answer was uh, that there was no textbook, no handbook in toponymy. Uh, a lot of uh, beautiful, uh, co very comprehensive, uh, uh, spectacular academic literature about place names, uh, but not uh, a volume, not a single volume, not a source uh, in a single volume about place names. Therefore, uh, from that course uh, in uh, NTU Singapore, I told uh, why not to write a book? a single volume about place names, not only for students, also for scholars uh, as a sort of sum of this uh, toponymic knowledge. And the idea started from that uh, moment. It was uh, 2017, uh, 2018. So with uh, my colleague, uh, Francesco Cavallaro, I wrote a sort of uh, outline for the book and we sent it to Cambridge University Press. Generally, when you propose a book uh, to a to an important uh, academic publisher, you need already to send them like uh, the outline, but a couple of uh, chapters already written, uh, references and so on and so forth. But uh, I had just that idea. So I just wrote the outline. Uh, Ellen Barton in Cambridge told, yes, I like the idea. Yeah. And so they approved it. And uh, the challenge was that uh, after that, uh, the book had to be written. And in any case, we were able to write it despite COVID, despite all the disruptions and so on and so forth. Of course, it was very long from 2018, I think, to 2023, but the book was published finally in March after a lot of revisions, comments by reviewers, changes, adjustments. In any case, the original idea, which is still the aim of the book, is to provide students, scholars with the source in single volume about the toponymy. So, Clearly, if you want to study toponymy, you need to refer to the huge scientific literature about the toponymy. But to start, uh, the book at least is there. You have a book, you don't need to look uh, for hundreds of papers uh, or to try to understand uh, how to group uh, a microtopic and another microtopic and so on and so forth. So place names uh, are incredibly relevant for the study of historical linguistics uh, and the book can be, maybe, might be, I hope it will be useful as a tool for learning toponymy from the scratch. So this is more wow. or less what. Wow, that's been interesting. Uh, for the audience, the editorial in which the book was published at uh, Cambridge University Press, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's one of the most important and relevant editorials of the world in academic writing, right? Yeah, it is true. They are one of the top with uh, Oxford, uh, Harvard, uh, Routledge. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we decided Cambridge just uh, because it's Cambridge and uh, yeah, they were super friendly and super enthusiastic about the idea. So uh, initially the work was really, really nice. I, I mean, also later in the later stages, but I mean, we had a, a good uh, impact. Okay. And then after you have published this book, uh, this book, I guess you are using it, as you said before, with your students and in your lectures at the university and so on and so forth. But uh, are you getting feedback from all other places in the world that are reading the book and are giving you feedback or interesting conversations about the book? Yeah, uh, first uh, now, you know, I changed universities. So now I am in Xiang Zhao Tong, uh, Liverpool University in China, and I don't teach toponymy yet here. Ah, I okay. teach uh, historical linguistics, history of English, but of course, uh, some of my students have already received the book, they already read it. Uh, so of course, I, I try to, um, to, to use the book for, uh, uh, educational 
purposes, of course, and toponym is historical linguistics, and so it's always the same, the same context. As far as my colleagues, uh, yeah, the book was published in March, so it's quite uh, okay. recent, but uh, some of my colleagues uh, already read it, of course, they gave me their uh, opinions. Um, I, I can tell you that the, the most, uh, one of my best friends in uh, friends in, in life, but the best friends, uh, academic friends in toponymy, uh, Jan Tent, who is a very famous uh, um, Australian um, toponymist, uh, he, he, he is writing a book in toponymy. So we ah. were not doing any race, any competition. I didn't know that he was writing a book in toponymy because he has already written a, a, a number of extraordinary papers in toponymy. But he was very keen on reading the book uh, and he, he, he took a look and uh, he thought good. So that uh, to me is the best possible compliment because he's a uh, uh, it's not I, only a friend, but of course it's a, it's a master, it's a point of reference. So yeah, and now we will see. Uh, probably some reviews will come out. Uh, maybe they will be extremely negative. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> in the book, uh, in the book, there are some um, sort of uh, experimental uh, reconstructions. We we try to to, of course, to follow sound established methodologies and uh, the comparative methods so from the 18th century. But there are some. Uh, uh, experimental reconstructions based on, based on uh, the not only the historical phonetic, historical phonological, historical morphological interpretation of place names, uh, but also with the interpretation of the meaning, so with the historical semantics of place names. So we change some etymologies. We try to provide the readers with some uh, uh, alternatives, some, something like that, not by saying, oh, this is the reconstruction or this is the new reconstruction, just by saying it may be. We were not there with the prehistoric speakers. We were not there talking with them. We have no prehistoric speakers to ask directly, but what does this place name mean? And so we have tried to provide a range of, uh, of options. Mm. So maybe some okay. viewers will not like it. <laughs> maybe they will not like it. Well. <laughs> what is this? What, what is this? Yeah. But it always happens in any kind of research, uh, linguistics, uh, chemistry, in any field, it always happens. You do the best uh, book, whatever in the world, and then you get always kind of reviews, right? Okay, <laughs> so so talking now about the book, um, and as for the audience to understand a little bit how the process is, I I understand about the little bit that I read uh, in your book that uh, you explore the places of the names, and then you try to provide kind of explanation about how the name evolved during time. And then, as you said before, I guess there are kind of classical methods or classical procedures. But in this case, you use kind of alternative method, this experimental approach that you were talking about. OK, can you uh, quickly tell us how how is this procedure? I don't know if you uh, kind of try to get all the information in the literature about this place. I guess, and all related information, and then you use some tools in order to get information about how the name evolves or how is it the procedure? Yeah, the, the procedure is complex and it depends on uh, how old uh, a place name is uh, or can be. So if the place name is uh, um, prehistoric, uh, you think that the, pla the place name is prehistoric, uh, you, you need to do documentary research uh, up to a point in which there is no more documentation there is no more writing so i don't know you take a place name you go back uh, in time uh, in the last uh, centuries uh, and then uh, you look at uh, uh, medieval documents for example from the middle ages uh, you see oh is uh, if it is in europe uh, was this place name uh, already there under the romans uh, did the romans uh, conquer this place and they changed the place name so we have two different versions uh, one is the roman one and the other one is the pre-roman one and what happened before the romans and so on and so forth and then you you get to a point in time uh, in which uh, there was no more uh, there is no 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 more no yet not yet writing at that point of course like you told uh, you need to apply um, the comparative methodology so you needed to compare that version of the place name you have uh, with uh, other lexical items uh, from the same language, uh, say Celtic, I don't know, to other languages, uh, say Germanic, uh, Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, uh, and whatever, and to see how the place name could have been uh, uh, produced in the shape you have, uh, and what could it be an ancient, more ancient form, we call that form uh, protoform, which is a proto-word. It is a proto, not because uh, 
it didn't exist. It is proto just because it is not written. So not attested okay. in a written document. And from there, you try to connect the proto form to its root. Uh, what is a root in historical linguistic is the mother of a family of words, uh, which can be, I don't know, a family of words for uh, names of animals, uh, names of uh, plants, uh, names of everything. And if you are able to connect your place name with those family of words, uh, you can look at the possible origin. So this place name was called this way because uh, it was called after a tree, or it was called after an animal, or it was called after, a, I don't know, a phenomenon uh, of uh, heavenly bodies, planets, stars, and so on and so forth. So this is more or less the procedure when you try to get back in time uh, to and towards prehistory, so in time without writing. And it depends. Maybe it is not necessary. Maybe you have a medieval name, and for the medieval name, you just uh, uh, stick to medieval documents. And in that case, uh, your analysis uh, is... Uh, a little bit less historical linguistic, uh, so a sort of chain towards the past, uh, and it is more uh, documentary. You look at the documents uh, and you try to see if uh, the place name is affected by a phenomenon uh, which is called uh, paretymology. We, paretymology is a folk etymology, a wrong etymology. The, the example I always uh, provide my students with uh, is an Italian place. Uh, uh, you are Spanish, so you, you understand uh, clearly. It's called, uh, this place is called Borgo Male. Uh, Borgo is a village, you know, and Male is a uh, bad, evil, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And so it's a bad village, an evil village, or something like that. And uh, this, everyone uh, wonders why this village is so bad. It's a beautiful village, uh, vineyards around, uh, uh, very nice people, very small, a beautiful castle. So why this, this place is so bad? And uh, you go to the speakers. You go to the village and you ask them before even mm. starting your documentary research, and they have a story. They tell you the village is not bad, but it is called Bad Village because uh, during the Black uh, Plague, uh, during the, bla the Black Death, the plague, uh, the different waves, uh, the village was hit so strong that uh, almost everyone died. And indeed, now mm. they are like 200 inhabitants. And so since we were hit so much, uh, uh, we were thinking it was uh, sort of a curse or something like that. We called the village Borgo Male, the village of uh, the bad, the evil, that kind of evil, so the, the, the Black Plague. And you say, okay, this is the story. Uh, so let's uh, double check it. Let's look for medieval chronicles and post medieval chronicles uh, saying that Borgo Male was hit or the area of Borgo Male was hit by the plague. And you find nothing. You go to the church, you go to the parish, you look for mm. the registers, the records of uh, people who died and uh, people who were born during that specific uh, fork, uh, range of time, and you see that there are no variations, always uh, the 200 inhabitants. So you, you say, okay, they have given me the story, it is the explanation of the name of the village, but there are no historical records uh, attesting this. So the plague didn't hit particularly violently, violently the place. So this etymology provided by the speakers, by the inhabitants, it's a par etymology, it's a fake etymology. It is because they needed to explain why they place okay. their place is bad. They don't want that their place is bad, so they had to create a story. And over the centuries, this story has become true for them. They believe that that is the real origin of the name. But if you look at the documents, and if you look just around, you go um, in the village, you walk there, you look at the coat of uh, the, the, the coat, uh, the, the emblem of the municipality, hmm? uh, you will see that uh, there is the hill of Borgomale. Borgomale is located on a hill. And uh, rather than vineyards, now there are vineyards, so you don't find vineyards in the um, coat of arms, you find uh, trees, uh, which are apple trees. And there is also a bear who is eating an apple from the apple tree. And then you go through the uh, records uh, and you will discover that uh, now it's all vineyards, but uh, in the Middle Ages and also a little bit later, the area of Borgomale was dotted in apples. So there were orchards of apples, the apples of Borgomale, they were famous. And so you think, uh, because you are classically trained, you know a little bit of Latin, and so you, you know that in Latin there are two words which are malum, Malum with short A means bed. Malum with long A means apple. In Italian, okay. long A has become E. So malum uh -huh. has become mela, apple. And short A has become A. So malum has become male, bed. 
Therefore, the name of the village was Burgus Mali, but Mali with long A. So not mm -hmm. the village of the bad thing or the village of the evil, but the village of the apple, the village of the apple trees. Uh, and, and it's a good name. It's a descriptive name. It's normal. You don't need to go back to prehistoric times. Uh, and it's exactly the name of the village. Therefore, when you don't need uh, to go back to prehistory before writing, so to apply all this kind of uh, historical phonetic, historical phonological reconstruction, um, you, you make a documentary research. Generally, you try to spot par etymologies. So, of course, you don't believe uh, to the explanation uh, that, that you find readily available by the speakers. and. Uh, you, you will have surprises, like this one of Borgomale, which is not the evil village at all, but it's the village of the apple or the village of the apple trees uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So this is more or less the procedure. Of course, it depends on a case by case basis. You, you, we are talking about Europe, big uh, bodies of literature, big documentation, big everything. Go in a desert island uh, to do language documentation, go in an Aboriginal context, uh, it's all different. You don't find anything apart from the speakers uh, in 2023, um, diaries of missionaries uh, or reports by colonizers. They are always very ambiguous. Uh, maybe you have some topographic map, uh, but uh, the places are the places. So you just ask the speaker, what is the name of this village? And then you ask for the explanation. And even when the explanation is transparent, uh, you will have always uh, some puzzles. You go in uh, Indonesia, you ask them, uh, what is the name of this village? And then they tell you, this is very simple. It's the village of the mango trees. So you say, okay, because here there are mango trees, but there are no mango trees. There is no mango at all. And you ask, and you ask the elders and you ask them, but do you remember mango trees uh, here? No, they don't remember. And so you say, okay, if there were mango trees, they are before, uh, this generation of all the people in this village. And then you ask them and you re-ask them and then you go to look for a storyteller and then they will tell you there is a guy who lives in a cave you have to go there and to talk with him and you will discover that he will tell you a story. He will tell you a story about a mango tree and about a hero who was doing I don't know what uh, and uh, went under the, the, that mango tree to rest. But this story maybe was not even the story of that place. It was a story imported by some guys who had to migrate from one part of the island to that part of the island. And so the mango trees were not there, but they were in the other part of the island. So it, this is called imported place name. Uh, so in that case, you don't do any historical linguistic reconstruction. You don't do any documentary reconstruction because there are no documents. You just do field linguistics. You stay with the speakers, you talk with them, you make some little detective work you chase them, you chase the storyteller, you chase the, the owner of the story. And in the end, you will discover that maybe the simple mango tree village is not that simple because uh, there are no mango trees. There was never a mango tree there. There is a story about mango trees, but the story comes from, I don't know, 50 kilometers far, okay. uh, and so on and so forth. This is exactly the work that uh, she, uh, she was, uh, is doing now. She's working with native speakers and she's uh, trying to chase them uh, to wow. uh, extract the data from stories and, uh, uh -huh. and uh, oral traditions. Yeah. What's, it's very interesting. I have here two questions. Uh, well, I had one question while you uh, were giving this explanation, but you already answered the, the question. But the next is, uh, when you perform this kind of detective work, uh, how long can it take on average? like you talk with the native people and you talk with this guy, this other guy, which is in another part of the island. Ha, how on average, this is the work that Sijue is working at the moment, right, Sijue? Yeah, yeah. And now, so now we are like a restrict in China now. We cannot go to the land to do the real field work. So mainly we arrange like two hours meeting online, but it's a little bit hard to like finish all of the questions I want to ask because you we ask one questions and they may give you the answer and then they may come up with a lot of another uh, like associations about your questions. Like I ask them how do they use their counting system and then they may have some another associations about their sayings, their proverbs about the quantifiers of the numbers and other things. So it may usually, although we want to arrange like a meeting in two hours, but I think if it's, if you do the real field work, it's of course a long time about this. 
Okay, okay. And one ignorant question. Amian, I have been reading a little bit this paper, which is called The Legend of Lamo Ling, uh, which is some, some island. Um, here, of course, you need to communicate with native people there. Uh, how do you do this? Uh, do you use some kind of intermediate translator? or you learn a little bit the language, but I guess these languages, because are some other people, some, some other work from you, where you say uh, some of these places are not documented. So how do you, communi how do you communicate with these people? Yeah, um, so it, it depends, of course. Before answering your question, I just answered the previous question on my side, uh, just because uh, I can be the dad of Shiwa, so I'm older. Uh, you, <laughs> you told me how, how long does it take uh, uh, when we were in Alor, the island that we are working on in southeastern Indonesia, um, we were trying to reconstruct a story about a snake, a god snake. I can tell you that the first time we met the story was 2003. The first version wow. of the story we got from a speaker, but to get the full version of the story, all the contents, all the place names, all the plot, the, the whole plot, we needed to chase the real storyteller. It's called the owner of the story. And that took until 2014. So wow. we met the story for the first time in 2003, and then we got the full, hopefully, the full version of the story in 2014. So 11 years of a field work. When, of course, when you work in a, in a university, you need to teach to be in the university for the semesters. So that generally the field work is a summer field work. You can stay 30 days, you can mm -hmm. stay two months with the speakers. But in any case, for all those field works, all those years, we were chasing this ghost of this guy who was on the top of a mountain, literally. And in the end, wow. we were able to, say, to find him, to persuade him, to provide us with the story. So it was a very, very long process. For, uh, for the, the, the other question, uh, the other question you, um, you ask, uh, uh, yeah, it's more technical. It depends on... Uh, how good you are with Aboriginal languages, uh, 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 how, the extent of the time you have to learn them. In our case, uh, uh, and uh, the papers you, you were mentioning, uh, they are about the Abui language from Aror Island, Timor, Southeast Indonesia. Abu is a Papuan language from that small island. Um, in my case, in my case, there are years and years now that I work on Abui. I, I know a little bit of Abui uh, in case of emergency. I can be wow. understood by the speakers just because I have been with them. But uh, the point is that uh, for uh, the linguistic analysis, uh, I need uh, a consultant, a speaker. We have a, a, a Bui uh, speaker. His name is Benny, Benedictus Del Pada, who is also the consultant of uh, uh, Shiwe, and mm. uh, is uh, uh, trained in linguistics. He, he has a master oh. in linguistics from NTU, but he lives in the islands. So he is the guy who materially uh, interact with the speakers who are not bilingual, who don't speak English, they just speak uh, their language, and then Baza Indonesia, of course, uh, Indonesian. Uh, so he interacts with them. He also looks for them uh, according to his experience. So he says, uh, this uh, person uh, can know this uh, story, or this uh, person uh, is expert, I don't know, in the names of the trees. So we talk uh, with him or with her about the trees of their islands and so on and so forth. And he's the guy also who double checks the information we receive because we record, we transcribe, we try to interpret and to analyze, but Benny is always the one who says, okay, this word is real, Abui, or look, you have transcribed wrongly this word and so on and so forth. So yeah, theoretically and in general, especially then if you switch to another language or if you are working on a group of languages from an island or from a territory, you need that one or more uh, local uh, consultants. And this is uh, easy when you have already some uh, links uh, to the local people. Mm -hmm. The study of Abui lately has been conducted by NTU, now by me in uh, Xi'an Jiaotong Liverpool University, but uh, was started uh, uh, in early 2000 from uh, the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. So those guys were the first guys having contacts with the Abui people and establishing connections to have then consultants. And then we expanded the team. There are peoples, indigenous peoples, Aboriginal peoples who are a little less available, even in that island. And so it's more difficult to have a reliable or stable pool team of consultants. 
In that case, of course, it's better to be in the island uh, to try to establish relationships uh, to be accepted by the community, and that uh, requires time, of course. Not all of them uh, wanted to talk with you. They are super nice, they are super friendly. They give you everything they have, but sometimes they don't want to talk with you because you are considered, of course, uh, external, a foreigner. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to provide you with their oral traditions because they say, this is our uh, soul, this is our uh, cultural identity. It belongs to us. It's uh, Even if they are myths, to them, they are history. They are in history. They know everything. They have the television. I mean, but uh, to them, it's their intimate history. And so sometimes it's difficult to them just to to give it to you because you are not a member of the community. You didn't grow up with them and so on and so forth. So yeah, okay. the, the suggestion to all students in field linguistics who works on the field is learn the local language. But sometimes uh, there is not enough time. Sometimes the local language is terribly difficult. Sometimes you are working on a group of languages. And so it's uh, even more difficult to learn or to master them all. So consultants are uh, really essential. Our uh, Benny is very valuable. <laughs> when it doesn't escape, sometimes it's impossible to find him, and that is a problem. <laughs> it's a bit elusive. Huh? A bit elusive. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. And w another question would be, um, uh, why do you decide, for instance, in this work, uh, for the audience, don't worry, I will put all, all, all the links in the show notes, but for instance, in this work called La Moling Beaca, uh, in this island, uh, why do you take the decision or the motivation to study this part of the world and not another part of the world? Because, for instance, as you said before, in Europe, there is a lot of documentation because uh, written from and everything. But when you go to these islands, it's more complicated, that, like you said. But uh, why do you decide at some point to study some island in Indonesia or other part of the world? The idea, the basic idea, I mean, in general, all, all the language documentaries working on all the languages uh, is that these languages are dying. There are very okay. few speakers. Uh, the new generations don't speak anymore these languages. And so one generation or just uh, 10 years uh, and the language uh, will be not spoken uh, and not spoken anymore. If you don't record it, if you don't uh, make a grammar of it, uh, if you don't document it, uh, that the language uh, will disappear forever. No one will ever uh, know that it existed. And you know, there are 7,000 languages in the world now. I don't know, just some hundreds are documented or have a body of literature, I don't know, dead or alive. And all the others are not documented or they have not a written tradition. Uh, among them, a lot are endangered, just, uh, you have, I don't know, 500 speakers. New generations generally don't speak those languages anymore. Think about Indonesia. Everyone speaks Bahasa Indonesia, the language of Indonesia. But all the Papuan, Austronesian, uh, and uh, other minorities, mm -hmm. they, they they don't study their languages in school. So the main target, uh, it's everywhere, Australia, Amazonia, wherever in the world. The main target is, uh, as a linguist, is to save, to safeguard uh, these languages. Mm -hmm. um, maybe by doing that, you save or safeguard also a bit linguistics, because linguistics today is really sinking, it's becoming something strange. But uh, yeah, the, the aim is to protect these, uh, these languages. Why we have chosen uh, Indonesia? Okay, in NTU, it's because we were in Singapore, so it's uh, also for a geographical okay. uh, point. But uh, it's uh, uh, just because of the experiences of the linguists who were there in that moment. Mm, the, the professor, Francis like Kratoshvil, now he's in Czech Republic in Palachka University in Olomouc, but he was a professor in NTU, uh, to me. Uh, he, he was coming from Leiden in the Netherlands. And Leiden was the university who took first contacts uh, with the Abui people uh, in uh, Alor Island. Therefore, uh, he decided to focus uh, on these people and NTU was the ideal place because we were relatively close from Singapore to Timor, more or less. Um, so that was an opportunity of um, geography, previous uh, contacts, uh, and the fact that we had uh, the 90 speakers who were already our consultants, uh, and the fact that uh, in the island, uh, it's not only spoken Abui, but a lot of other uh, languages uh, which are uh, uh, not attested, which are endangered, which are not documented, uh, and so that was uh, allowing us, was giving us the opportunity to expand, to document not only okay. one language, but a set of languages uh, belonging to the same uh, uh, local language family, and so not only to document them, but to compare them and maybe to reconstruct the, the language all these Papuan peoples uh, were speaking before thousands and thousands of years ago when they 
arrived in the Thailand. The, the same motivation is the motivation of all the, the language documentaries in the, in the world. Here we are in China, uh, many language documentaries, the Chinese and non-Chinese, they work on the languages of minority peoples all over China in remote, remote villages. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the member of our team, George, before working in uh, in uh, on Abui on uh, Papuan Indonesian languages, uh, he was working in Amazonia. So I mean, it's uh, all a mix of experiences. Point is that there are not enough linguists <laughs> to document <laughs> all these languages. So it's uh, right. uh, really impossible, uh, mission impossible. Yeah, it's complicated, but it's very interesting. But there is a, a Shiwe. Uh, she is the new generation. <laughs> uh, she has a lot of years in front of her, and she's already very promising. The, the last Great. days she was interviewing our speakers, she discovered a lot of things that uh, after 20 more years I didn't know. So you see, it's a oh. continuous process. And really, it goes generation by generation, not only for the speakers, but also for the linguists. Okay, okay. I, I, I will get later into that. Uh, I have another question. Uh, I guess, I guess there are, um, re reading a little bit your papers, there are some common uh, reasons about why some cities uh, keep their names or the reasons kind, kind of religion, the mango tree, uh, the, the apple tree, and so on and so forth. But my question is, uh, studying some remote places, have you ever found something that was totally unexpected? when explaining the names of the places? Yeah, I understand your question. It depends on what you mean uh, <laughs> with the totally, so, totally... Something, so, something that was not um, kind of uh, something that didn't happen before. I guess this is very complicated because people tend to give the name of the places following religion or traditions and so on and so forth, but I don't know. Something that was not expected at all. Uh, the not expected is the impenetrable place name. So it's a place name and there are, <laughs> which you cannot explain. You can just try, you can just propose okay. hypotheses, but those hypotheses, they are not even convincing for yourself. And so, yeah, especially this, I have to say, it doesn't happen in my experience in uh, uh, Aboriginal or Indigenous context. Uh, it happens some more in Europe. Europe has uh, still some uh, very prehistoric, uh, ununderstandable place names. They are so... Uh, stratified, multi-layered over time. They have uh, undergone uh, so many changes in population and settlement dynamics or whatever, that uh, even if you are super trained, even if you know everything about place names, even if you have uh, conquered everything, in the end you say, how can I explain this place name? Uh, sometimes mm. the explanation is very simple, apparently is there, but in order to give it, you have to betray your knowledge, you have to betray the laws, of uh, historical phonetics, uh, and so you do that, but you don't want to do that, uh, and you don't know how to solve uh, the, the the mystery, the puzzle. So maybe they are very simple. They are connected apparently with water or with uh, the, the the greenery, the vegetation of a place. Uh, but in order to make that connection, you have to break them in a way that is not the correct traditional way. Okay. And so you say, what what happens? Uh, um, you want an example if you have time? I don't know. Uh, yeah, of it's course, one please. Of the, it's one of the controversial examples in the book. The ones I tell you, probably some linguists will say, what is this? What is this? Uh, so there is a place in, in, in Italy. It's a, it's a very small village. It's called Squaneto. S-Q-U-A-N-E-T-O. Squaneto. Um, what, what is this place name? No one knows. It's, no one knows, it's really difficult, it's impenetrable. Um, you, you can try to reconstruct it traditionally and you will get that uh, it can mean in Indo-European uh, um, meadow, meadows, uh, flowers in the meadows uh, and stuff like that, uh, which means everything and nothing because uh, you would have to suppose that uh, there were flowers in that meadow and that prehistoric mm. people have given that name. But generally, prehistoric places are not connected with that kind of description. Uh, prehistoric uh, humans uh, had to survive. They needed <laughs> water, shelter, uh, food. So where they were calling the places according to that, primary goods, water, food, uh, animals, danger, and so on and so forth. They had no map. They had the map in their mind. And so when they were talking, possibly, they had to give a very significant uh, and simple names to their places. So a prehistoric man calling a... Uh, a place uh, um, after the flowers uh, may indicate that that place has been called in a time in which uh, they had already society. 
they were already protected. They had mm -hmm. another to escape from the wolves uh, and the bears. They had already the stomach full. Uh, and you don't know, that place seems uh, too ancient for that kind of naming process. So what do you do? You do and you don't do, you do and you don't do. You look at the name, Squaneto, Squaneto, Squaneto. What if between S and Q, mm -hmm. there were a, a Saquaneto? If it mm -hmm. is a Saquaneto, you cut the S and it's Aquaneto. And Aqua, Aqua, Agua, it's water. And where is located that place? That place is located on the water, on a very special place of water. It is located on a ford, uh, which allows uh, humans uh, to, to cross uh, a river. And that ford is there for geological eras, but people were on that ford from at least 38,000 years ago. So the upper Paleolithic, way before Mesolithic, way before, before Neolithic. Wow. Uh, it's so ancient, uh, you have found uh, uh, tracks uh, of these prehistoric uh, inhabitants, uh, humans, uh, there it's so ancient that clearly those people, whoever they were, clearly they were not Indo-Europeans, the Indo-Europeans arrived later, but clearly those people had a name for that place. And that place was not only a water place where you were going to fish or to drink, but it was a ford. So the most important place uh, for crossing uh, the river in that specific area. So why this place uh, could not be a water place so Saquaneto, Aquaneto, the place of water. It cannot be, I mean, it may be, but it cannot be because there is that S <laughs> and the okay. S is the root consonant. You cannot cut the root consonant. That is, a, I mean, a, a big mistake or a big inappropriate thing in historical linguistics. So you feel that maybe it's for real Saquaneto. There are other places like that. Saquajato, Squajato, Saquana. Mm -hmm. So you say there is a system but uh, you are not the proof, you are not with the um, prehistoric speakers, you cannot bend the rules uh, thinking about your discovery. So it's, um, if it is true, it's like when you are a mathematician and you know the solution of a specific problem, but you don't know how to demonstrate it. You know that okay. the solution is uh, correct. Everyone knows maybe, but uh, no mathematician has been able yet to d demonstrate it, to give it a demonstration. So yeah, maybe they are not a very spectacular place names, uh, but they stay <laughs> here on your stomach and you cannot solve them, you cannot solve them. I talk about <laughs> some of them in the book uh, and I'm afraid that, that they will be penned, they will be destroyed <laughs> with other linguists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this yeah. is the unexpected, yeah. Or the, wow. the un unsolvable in a way. You, you easily yeah. solve it uh, if you don't think about the meaning. You can uh, say, okay, this is the place of the flowers and good night. It works phonetically, morphologically, phonologically. But uh, you say, what flowers? What, what is it? This is a water place. You look at the inhabitants there way before the Indo-Europeans and you have a possible explanation, but uh, you mm -hmm. have not the tools uh, to, to make it 100% that. Okay, so talking talking about the tools, you know, I'm computational chemist from background. So my question now is, um, you have a knowledge, you, she, you, and you, you are linguists, so you have some knowledge and you know the state of the art. But uh, uh, do you use also computational tools? Are there kind of databases where you can kind of uh, introduce your hypothesis in order to get additional information? about why this place has this name. Uh, so in general, can you use computational tools or databases, or even since we are uh, now at the time of artificial intelligence tools in order to provide you more, more information for your research? Uh, yeah, I don't use them in, uh, in uh, historical linguistics itself, but uh, I think I didn't tell you, uh, uh, we, we work, uh, especially in NTU, we're working on language deciphering. So the ah. decipherment of undecipher writing systems and specifically in NTU, we were working on a linear A, the undeciphered writing system from Crete, uh, Minoan language, which is just a name because no one knows the language since uh, it's impossible to write, uh, to, to read the writing system. And uh, mm. yeah, in that case, uh, since uh, all the attempts at deciphering uh, failed over time, and I work on that from 19, since 1999, so a very long time, and I, I surrendered, I mean, I, I, I gave up. I told that there is no solution. It's impossible to decipher this writing system. But so in NTU, we decided just to make a desperate attempt to be, uh, to, to remove all the biases, everything we knew, everything we believed to know. Uh, and uh, we, we created a, a we, we wrote a Python program, which uh, we, we 
we implemented with this machine, it's a computer, a computer which runs this uh, uh, Python program to, to make a sort of brute force attack to linear A, so a mm. crypto analytic brute force attack. We took uh, the possible transcription of linear A on the basis of another writing system called the linear B, which is deciphered. And we took uh, uh, dictionaries from all possible uh, languages uh, possibly compatible with linear A at the level of time, so ancient Egyptian, Amito Semitic, uh, Itite, Luvian, Akkadian, and so on and so forth. Uh, we made a transcription of linear A, which are really arbitrary since it is an undeciphered. Transcriptions of all the other uh, well known, documented, and attested languages. Uh, and we decided to feed the computer, the machine, uh, with these transcriptions. So we asked the Python program to try to match them. Uh, it, it work that uh, if you do that by end, uh, you can spend 20 years. Uh, the computer does that in some minutes. Uh, and then the computer tells you, OK, in this tablet, uh, there is this possible match, or there are these possible matches between linear A, I don't know, and Akkadian. Uh, the human element is you take the results, you look uh, how many, so frequency, how many are these possible matches? Where are they? Are they in the tablets of linear A always in the same position? No same position? Are they random? Are they not random? Uh, are they in all the tablets coming from a specific place, Knossos, the capital city of Crete, or another place, or they are just, again, sparse, random? Uh, are they indicative? So these words uh, are possible possible words for the contents of these tablets, like items, I don't know, a ship, mm -hmm. a sword, or whatever, or are they completely um, crazy, like a sky, sea, and so on and so forth. And by making these comparisons, uh, you try to see if uh, there are possible similarities between the possible language hidden behind the linear A and the uh, attested, well-known, uh, documented uh, languages, uh, which are uh, neighboring and more or less contemporary to linear A. It's a desperate attempt. It's the classic uh, brute force attack. You try all the... Mm -hmm. the options but uh, everyone always failed i failed epically many times wow. and so this was the last uh, last attempt but uh, since we are talking about computational uh, efforts uh, this uh, yeah was very computational because uh, i'm not good in coding we had uh, our engineer writing the python program so we had the idea but he mm -hmm. calling uh, calling law is his name he implemented uh, it uh, and now I changed university, but we had a team of uh, research assistants who were uh, working this way. So feeding the program, feeding the machine with these uh, spreadsheets with uh, comprehensive transcriptions, uh, and then manually double checking all the possible matches. If they are just random, if this is just a case, uh, if they can be significant at the level of frequency, position, uh, place of the tablets, uh, uh, amount, I mean, quantitative level, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, when I have a new team, <laughs> I will let you know <laughs> how this thing is uh, is going. Yeah, is <laughs> please, please. Very, very interesting, very interesting. Okay, and uh, you have studied uh, many different languages. Uh, can you tell us about from all your different projects? Uh, can you highlight one you liked the most, not because scientific reasons, but because, I don't know, uh, you felt you solved a mystery or a very complicated problem when you could understand a little bit that language, some some preference between your projects? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I understand, of course, your uh, your question. Uh, it's it's, a, it's <laughs> a obvious, but the, the best project is uh, the next, uh, clearly. I mean, what <laughs> we have still, uh, what we would have still to solve. I mean, everyone would answer that, I think. Uh, so it's not a very original, but it is true. Not that I am disappointed by the previous projects. Some of them, they have been, I was also younger. So I was more excited and they were uh, uh. exciting uh, uh, projects. Now I take everything <laughs> with a bit mm -hmm. of, uh, but um, uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, when you are young, young, so when you study and when you want to, to become a linguist, when you hope to become a linguist, you imagine Europe uh, in my time, uh, when I was a student, uh, economic uh, disasters, universities. Uh, in uh, I mean, uh, you, you dream to become a linguist, but uh, but uh, probably you will not become. Or to become it, you need to go uh, on the other side of the world. But in any case, yeah, the dream you have of doing the historical linguist is not uh, to reconstruct stuff, but the dream you have is to get back to prehistory and to really give mm -hmm. a better voice to to the prehistoric guys. They had no writing. They they were in a way not represented. Uh, and so by reconstructing their words, uh, it's not just to reconstruct the words, but is uh, 
to make them speak, like when you decipher and decipher language. You do that, of course, because it's a great, uh, exciting discovery, but uh, because you make those stones, those tablets, those documents uh, speak, you can read them finally, if you are able to, of course, and I'm not, but uh, in, in case. So that is, uh, in a way, the, the dream. Clearly, the uh, exciting part, which is purely academic and it's not exciting for all the other people, it's maybe when you are uh, able to demonstrate a theory you had, like uh, mm -hmm. you have, uh, let's talk about place names, you have uh, a set of place names, uh, you think that they are all connected, you think that they come all from the same route, but maybe they are sparse on a large area. So you need to demonstrate that, that they come, they are all connected with the notion of water, that they are all connected with a specific route for water. And despite that they are different, that they are connected and how those differences have been produced by the voice of speakers over millennia and centuries, uh, when you are able to recreate, to reconstruct uh, a set like that, which is called a toponymic system, it is not relevant. No one cares, uh, but you say, come on, guys, I did it. So that, uh, yeah, it's uh, exciting. It will be still exciting for me now that I'm not excited by anything anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, to, to, to answer in, in, in a different way to your question is uh, now we are working on... Uh, on uh, a, a not a well-known document. Uh, it's called an uh, epigraphic document. It's called the Singapore Stone. It's a it's a stone. It's it's an epigraph. Mm -hmm. But uh, the the British found it in uh, 1819 when uh, uh, Sir Raffles discovered colonized Singapore. Uh, it was just a slab, an epigraph uh, at the mouth of the Singapore River. In 1843, they blew it up because they needed wow. to open the mouth of the and so just some fragments of that inscription in this epigraph were preserved. They were sent to Kakuta to the museum, British Museum there, because in Singapore there was no museum to be studied, but they have been lost when Singapore got them back, mm. rather than three, only one went back. And now it's called the Singapore Stone. If you go to Singapore, it is in the National Museum. What is so special of this uh, Singapore Stone is that the inscription, the characters of the inscription don't exist anywhere else in the world. So we cannot read it. We do not know what kind of writing system is that. There are a lot of hypotheses, some possible identification, but until you are able to read a writing system, the writing system is undecided because it can be similar to this, similar to that, but you cannot read it with the same phonetic values. And so it's undecipherable. Uh, so yeah, we have a little project. We are trying to not to translate it, to decipher it, it's impossible. It's just one document, you have not enough materials. We are trying to reconstruct the missing text of the epigraph based on ancient reproductions by people, generally British people, before the inscription was blown up. And by doing that, of course, we would have more text, more characters. It's not even linguistics, it's philological. So you okay. try to reconstruct the missing text. It will not solve anything. But I'm old enough to be excited by such a thing. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so wow. this is, and this is a project in which also Shua is involved. She's working okay. also with that. It's just because I force her to work on everything. Uh -huh. I work on, uh -huh. But I think she, she enjoys it. I hope she enjoys it. Okay, so Shua, uh, which part of this project do you like the most? Uh, for me, I think the uh, most inspiring project is the language documentation project. So, because you really like, you really have the opportunity to interact with the indigenous people, and then you know how what's the meaning of their languages, and how you look through their how their words are formed, and then you ask you you ask uh, how what. Uh, you, you ask their thoughts of like form their words, and then you know their uh, not only the language itself and also their uh, like their ideas. Uh, so the like the interfaces of language and their cognition is very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> wow. but in, but, but... She, she's working on their uh, mainly now on their uh, numbering systems on counting. Mm -hmm. She's making some discoveries about. Uh, how indigenous people count differently from us at the cognitive wow. level, how they make additions, not additions, how they compose their numbers. And now she's even studying how they, they are counting, uh, I mean, with the ends, the different ways of counting with the ends. They are surprising. Okay, this like, would be like, your, your, 
Yeah. Like we op we open our end when we count. Uh -huh. uh, they close their end when we count. So they, st they, the, they start uh -huh. already with the number so outside. And but she knows better than me. I'm just uh, <laughs> going through her discoveries. Yeah, please. Oh. Oh, yeah, so they're married, like four, uh, five kinds of like uh, finger counting systems in the world. So, like Europeans, you are counting like this one, two, three, four, five. But for China and USA, we are counting like one, two, three, four, five. But okay. like for Iran people, they count like this one, two, three, uh. four, five. But for Papua New Guinea people, they Counting like this, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and then for sign languages, they count like, uh, oh my God, for, oh, like this, uh, what, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, oh my God, uh, so, so the sign language is a little bit uh, complex. It's not very, like, uh, uh, like in a se sequential. Older, but but like <laughs> it's just oh, so uh, different. Uh, yeah, it's different, and then it may uh, like to indicate different kind of mindset of people, and then may related to their culture, their traditions, and uh, like like for uh for uh, uh for the popular new genius people i think because when i asked about their counting system and how they count about the numbers they always told me how they are like counting the rice the coins when they are doing the harvest uh when in like they harvest the coins and the rice and then they make uh grouping them and then count them in different ways and then also about their prices when they are doing trade with others so mm -hmm. uh, when they're asking numbers they're not always like um, give me some specific numbers they may use in their life or rather they just give me the uh, activities they do when they are using these numbers and usually they're connected with the uh, their agriculture and uh, also the trade and some uh, some traditions they have okay so this will be your first paper. Uh yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah. I think you have a lot, lots of motivation in doing this. As uh, uh, lo lots of luck on this on this project. I think it will get. And, and please tell us when this paper is online so that we can read a little bit about about these systems. Okay, great. I think it was in very interesting. Uh, we are getting to the end of the episode. Uh, so my my last question would be totally unexpected, and then it is not about science; it is about uh, science fiction. I don't know. I don't know because it depends on you. If you watch a movie, a movie called The Arrival. Oh yeah, yeah, Arrival, yeah. You know there is this movie they, they when there is the, some. They made it watch also in the university. Our department in NTU. They I, I watch it uh, uh, independently, but our department in NTU. Uh, there was a professor, Randy Lapolo, was there, a famous language documentarist. He asked the ah. students to watch it. Yeah, arrival. Really? Because uh, of the, the linguistic component. Okay. So just for the audience, the plot is that there is some aliens that come to Earth, and then uh, some linguists, right, try to communicate with them in order to understand their language. The movie was very interesting because first, the main character was a linguistic, <laughs> which is great. And yeah, but you know, movies always try to exaggerate things. But from a linguistic point of view, do you think this movie was kind of accurate or it made sense the way they tried to get the language of the aliens? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, she she reconstructed in a way yeah, the, the, the single components of the language. Of course, not uh, phonetics phonology. She reconstructed a bit the morphology of the language. And so she was able to... It, it, it is not a fiction procedure. It's like okay. you would do for documenting the language, of course, uh, a language you cannot uh, hear mainly. Mm -hmm. So documenting the language based on uh, symbols. Uh, but yeah, it's a linguistic procedure. So no, no, the, the, the procedure was quite uh, accurate or uh, in a fictional uh, set, uh, how a linguist could proceed. For this reason, okay. in, the, in the, my previous department in NTU, they asked the students to watch it because it was wow. not just fiction, but it was a fiction with ling real linguistic components. Yeah. So the, the analysis okay. was not uh, just uh, 
fanciful. No, no, no. Yeah, it, it was, um, in my uh, interpretation, it was essentially morphological, which is okay. good, a good perspective. Yeah. Very interesting. Meaningful, meaningful. meaningful. Okay. <clears throat> so thanks a lot. Uh, it has been a, a pleasure to to learn so many things about your work. I think it's really interesting. Uh, as I said, as I said before, I will leave in the show notes all the links to the very interesting research that Francesco and Shigue and their group do. And yeah, uh, so it was a lot of pleasure to talk with you. L wish you lots of luck in your research, and please keep us updated with the new things that you publish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for us. Uh, you have been a Thank super you. kind uh, and a great interview. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.